Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for being here this morning. It's great to have you in our service. There's an old Indian tale that talked about a nest that was up in the top of a tree that had a a baby bird in it. And one night a storm came blowing through and the mother had not gotten back to protect this nest and the storm came through very quickly and it blew this tree over. And the nest came toppling down and the baby bird did too, but the baby bird was not hurt. And the baby bird made its way to another nest where there were other baby chicks, baby birds, and, and it was a turkey nest. And there was a mother there and she accepted this little bird in and she raised that little bird as if it was her own. As time went by and as that little, those babies grew, the one baby understood that it was different from the other ones. It realized that it was just peculiar. It, its legs were shorter, its wings were longer. The mother taught the, the kids how to run and it could never keep up. His wings would just get in the way because they were just so long and gangly and, and unusual. The mom taught them how to to eat and pick at grain and bugs in the, in the ground. And the baby turkeys, they did just a great job. They knew how to do that. Their bodies were connected and built for that. But this other little bird, it couldn't do it. Its beak was turned down at the end and it was hard to pick things up. Its wings were long and its legs were short. And when it would try to reach over and grab things, sometimes it would fall over because it just wasn't made for that. The little bird felt like it just didn't fit in. There's something wrong with me. All my brothers and sisters look normal. My mom looks normal, but here I am. I just just don't fit in. I'm just not, there's just something wrong with me. As the little bird grew, it would look up in the sky and see the other birds, and especially the birds that would spread their wings out and would catch the wind and would begin to soar and get higher and higher. And that little bird thought, man, I wish that I could do that. I wish that I could be like those birds and I could spread my wings. As big as my wings are, I think I could do that. But look at those birds. They're up there and they're soaring and here I am down here and I just don't seem to fit in. I'm just a weirdo. I'm just just different. One morning when that little bird was getting out of its nest and the mom and the other birds had jumped down to the ground and began to, to forage around for bugs and seeds and this little bird stood up in the nest and just thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it. I'm, I'm gonna go for it this morning. I'm just gonna break away. I'm gonna jump and I'm gonna spread my wings and I'm gonna see if I can fly out of this place because I wanna be like that instead of like that. And so the little bird did. He jumped out of that nest and he spread his wings and a gust of wind pulled him up into the sky and he began to soar. He began to fly and he thought, this is in, un, un, unbelievable. This is what I was created to do. And he, he soared, and as he got up around those other birds, he realized they look just like me. They got my same wings, my same color. Their beak looks like mine. This is where I belong. And as time went by, he figured out that that down there on the ground wasn't where he belonged. And he found out that what had happened is that he was actually an eagle that had been thrown out of his nest, had grown up with turkeys. And instead of being a turkey, he was actually meant to be up in the sky with the eagles. And you know, then the, obviously the tagline comes, why am I living down here with these turkeys when I could be soaring with eagles? And you know what? Some of us were like that. We're in a situation in our lives and we look around and think, this is the way I've been brought up. This is what I know. This just doesn't fit me. There's something that needs to be taking place in my life. There's something that I'm not experiencing that I want to experience. I want to know what I was made to do. I want to know what my design is. I want to know who God shaped me and designed me to be. What my goal in life, what my purpose in life, how was I designed, how was I put together? And I want to be that person for God. This morning, I want to share with you just a little acronym. I think this is, a, it's, it's nothing new. Actually, Rick Warren back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, had written a book called Purpose Driven Church. And through his church being built, he went through and he had developed this little acronym called SHAPE, S-H-A-P-E. And I want to go through this this morning and talk about this word and this acrostic. And I want to help you guys understand how we can decide and how we can define 
who we are to be the very best and have the greatest potential that we can for the kingdom of God, all right? I'm gonna take you through this this morning and I hope that this will be something that helps you and opens up your eyes. The, the first part of this is, is shape and the first letter is S and let me show you this word. S, it stands for spiritual gifts. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, beginning in the um, 10th verse, actually beginning in the seventh verse. I wanna go through and, and read just portions of this scripture and I'll skip around just a little bit for you, but hopefully this will make sense to you. Beginning in the seventh verse. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ uh, apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave people gifts. Verse number 11. Christ himself gave the, um, so Christ himself gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, this scripture lets us know, number one, a couple of important things. I want you to go back and look at the first part of this scripture. It says, verse number seven, but to each one of us, God gives gifts. To each one of us, God gives gifts. This is the first thing I want you to know. God has given us gifts that he wants us to use for his glory. He has given each one of us gifts. None of us are exempt. You can say, I don't have any gifts. You do have a gift. We have to find out what that gift is. But God has given each one of us gifts. That's what the scripture says. Verse number 11, it says, Christ himself is the one who gave you the gifts. Christ gave you those gifts, made those gifts available to you. You may not have a bunch of gifts, but you've got probably more than what you know about. So God gives us gifts. Each one of us has gifts. Verse number 12, he gives us these gifts to equip the people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we reach unity of the faith. Here's the, case. Here's the, here, here's the situation. God has given the church gifts. He's given us pastors, teachers, prophets, apostles. He's given us people within the church to help build up and to teach the people to do the ministry of the church. I always, uh, you know, have a little bit of pushback when people say, well, pastor, you're supposed to do this. This is your job. You know, you're, you're, it's your job to visit people. It's your job to go to the hospital. It's your job to, you know, do, do these kind of things. Actually, my job is to teach the people of the church to do the work of ministry. And why is that? Well, the scripture says here, so that the body of Christ might be built up, so that we can reach unity of the faith, so in the knowledge of God himself, and become mature. And then it goes on from there, verse number 14. Then we will no longer, this is talking about the maturity part, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemes. In other words, what scripture is saying here is that the people of the church need to be trained to do the ministry so they can go out and do ministry. The church can reach unity of the faith and so that you can become mature in your faith. You can grow up and not be an infant swayed by every doctrine that comes along, but that we can be solid in our faith knowing what ministry is and knowing what God wants us to do. That's my job is to teach the people of the church to do this kind of stuff. Can I get an amen for that? You guys can acknowledge that. Verse number 15, instead speaking the truth in love, we grow up, again, talking about maturity, to become in every aspect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Christ is the head of the church. For him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting limit, ligament, grows <clears throat> and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I love this scripture because it just encapsulates, it helps us understand, number one, Every one of us have some kind of gift that God has given us. Number two, God gives us the gift or Christ gives us the gift. Number three, it is the pastor, teachers, it is the leadership of the church's responsibility to teach the people to discover what those gifts are so that you can become mature, so that the church can grow in unity, so that we won't be swayed by the wind of doctrine or people who come in and want to take us in different directions. But we know the word of God and we can know that we are a part of what God has for our life. That's what this scripture says. Do you guys see that? I want you to be able to see that and understand that. 
So when we go a few weeks back, a few months back maybe, uh, we did a, a message that we talked about going deeper and we talked about spiritual gifts. And I gave you several spiritual gifts and I taught on that. You can go back into it. It's, it's uh, the sermon series that we did deeper and it's message number four if you want to go back and look at that um, on our podcast um, or, or on the website. But if you go back and look at that, there were three things that I talked about is that we, three, we see three divisions of ministry gifts or of spiritual gifts, three divisions. Number, the first one is ministry gifts. They're the ones I just mentioned to you. They're gifts to the church, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. The second one are natural gifts that we have, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leadership, or leading, showing mercy, Words of wisdom, words of knowledge, discernment of spirits and faith. Those are natural gifts that we have that anybody can have that God gives them to us. Listen, they're different from the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what comes out of our life when we're saved. When we become a Christian, we ask Christ to come into our life. We become a Christian. We see fruit come out of our lives. And one of the greatest of those is love. So we see this kind of stuff that's coming out, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, uh, self-control. We see these things come out of a Christian life. And when you're around people who are Christians, you will see this stuff be developed in their life. This is a little bit different. These are talking about spiritual gifts. They're spiritual things. And the first one we talk about are ministry gifts. The second one are natural gifts. And the third one are what we call supernatural gifts. And they are our empowerment gifts, gifts of healing, miracles, tongues, prophecy, interpretation of tongues. These are given to the church to build the church up and encourage the church. That's what these gifts are for. And by us discovering what our spiritual gifts are helps us understand what am I conditioned to do? What am I gifted to do? Where am I going with this? What can I do in the ministry of the church that really makes a difference? We've got a whole tool that we're putting together now that Mitchell is out of school and he's got lots of extra time. Uh, we are going to be collaborating and we've got a process that we're putting together called Next Steps and we need to finalize that with some of this material and we're hoping to get that done this week or next week so that we can have a program that we set to you guys just about Next Steps. And one of those is an inventory that you can go through and be able to take a quiz or a, 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 an assessment online that you can be able to tell exactly what your spiritual gifts are. And there'll be more teaching on that. And in the summer, we're planning on doing a class that just deals with spiritual gifts and how to determine what our shape is. And so that's something we can determine what those spiritual gifts are. It's impossible for me to do it in one service unless we took the time to take the assessment and we'll have to do that online so that you guys will know how to do that. So that's forthcoming, okay? Number two is this. Heart. The second word in the acrostic is heart. H, heart. Heart or passion. What is your heart? What is your passion? Where is it that your heart is directing you? What, what does your heart have you doing? I love this scripture in Luke, the sixth chapter in the 45th verse. In NIV, it reads this. A good man brings good gifts out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Listen to this. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Now, in the ESV or KJ, King James Version, if you have that, it's a little more traditional. It's kind of the way I learned it, and it's what I have going over in the tape recorder of my head when I think of this verse. And it says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in other words... What is in my heart will eventually come out my mouth. What is stored up in my heart will eventually come out. If I have bitterness that's stored up in my heart, it eventually comes out of my mouth. You can talk to someone for 15 or 20 minutes, you can basically tell where their heart's at. Are they critical? Are they negative? Are they hurt? Are, 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 do they have a sweet spirit? Do they have a kind? Are they always encouraging? Are they always uplifting? Are they always motivation? Are, what are they? We, we've had lunch with some people and they, everybody is a little bit different. And I love doing that. I love getting to know you guys and hearing what your heart is and the direction that you're going because it helps me know better how to minister to you guys. But here's the thing. Our heart will determine where we end up. Our heart will show where our treasure is. Actually, if we keep going... Let me turn the page. If we keep going here in Romans, the 23rd chapter, well, let me read this one first. I skipped one. Romans, the 12th chapter, in the ninth verse, it says this, love what is sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, 
Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor or your passion. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. So this one talks about passion. What my heart is and what my passion is, have it be something that you serve the Lord with. And then the last scripture here in this portion is Luke 12, 34. It says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whatever my treasure is, my heart's gonna be there. You wanna know where your heart is, you look at where your treasure is. Where do you spend your time and your money and your efforts? That will let you know where your heart's at. Questions that I would ask for determining what your heart is is I would ask this, what will you get up early on a Saturday morning to do? That's usually where your heart's at. What will you stay up late at night on a Saturday night to do? (laughs) That's usually where your heart's at. What things do you lose track of time while you're doing that can determine where your heart is? What are you willing to financially support even if it means financial hardship for you? That shows where your heart's at. For some of you, it's your kids, isn't it? You're passionate about your kids. You're passionate about serving and helping your kids out. Some of you, it's it's an occupation. Some of you, you love your job. You can't get enough of it. Some of you, it's a hobby. Some of you just haven't found that, but while you determine what your heart is, if you'll answer these questions, it will help you determine where your heart is at. And if you can find out where your heart is at, you'll find out where your motivation is lying and you'll find out if it's something that you can use it for the kingdom of God. John Maxwell says, passion has great power. It is an intense emotion, a compelling action, a strong devotion to some object, activity, or concept. Passion is the starting point of all achievement. Passion is the energy of the soul. My passion in my heart drives me to where I'm going. It's what I want to do. And when I find what that passion is, here's the key. Can I use what my passion is? Can I use it for the kingdom of God and for the betterment of of people who are around me? Can I use what God has given me the passion for? He's instilled that inside of me. Can I use it for the kingdom? Now, some of you may have passions that aren't spiritual passions. Some of you may have passions that are going the wrong direction. Some of you have passions that weren't meant to be held up inside of you. You, 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 you need to be married. You need a spouse. Or you need to confess and, and talk to your spouse about what your passions are and either subdue those passions or redirect those passions or define those passions to know sometimes our passions don't go in the right directions and sometimes we have to bring the passions back to where we're supposed to be because passions can get out of line. When passions get out of line, they become destructive. The passions that are put in line and focused can be very beneficial for the kingdom of God. Number three is this, our abilities. What abilities do you have? What abilities has God put inside of you that you use for the kingdom of God? Romans 12, three says this, for by grace given me, I say to you, or I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves in sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. Again, God's given gifts and he distributes faith and abilities to each one of you. For just as each one has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, from one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. That's what we're talking about this morning. Here we see it in another place. According to the grace given us, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with that gift. If your gift is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. In other words, he's saying, whatever your ability is, whatever your gift is, do it with all of your might. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. But always be willing to take the gifts that you've given and you give it. And here's what you'll find out. As you give those things away, God will always make sure that you have an ample supply as you give away what he has given you. If it's love, then love people. If it's giving, then give to people. What has God put inside of you that he wants you to use? He's investing it in you. If he's going to move it through, he's not going to give it to you unless he can move it through you. As he moves it through you, he'll give more to you. Does that make sense? That's the abilities that we have. So the question I ask here is, what are your abilities? What are you good at? 
What do other people tell you that you're good at? Now, those are two really important questions that we need to stop and talk about here. Have you ever watched American Idol? Ever watch American Idol? Do you know that some people think that they're good at stuff and they just aren't? Do you know that? One time we were traveling and, and we were checking into a hotel and as I was going back to my room in the lounge in there was a girl that was singing. I think it must have been karaoke night. She was having the greatest time. Boy, she had all of her cowboy gear on and she was singing away and loving every minute of it. But can I tell you, singing was not her gift, okay? It was bad. It was horrible. I mean, it was monotone. It was really bad. And I just thought, you know what? What a great example. I wish I could bring her to church and let her sing for you guys sometime. <laughs> just say, this is not her gift. She may think it's her gift, but just because you think you have a gift doesn't mean that you're gifted to do that, all right? Here's how you'll know that you have a gift. What do people tell you that you're good at? Man, you are a great singer. You, Sandy, I love hearing you sing. Whether you think it's a gift or not, I love hearing you sing. And I especially love the look on your face when Joe sings because I see this kind of googly, oh. And that is the sweetest thing. That, she, do you notice he does that? I just noticed she does that. And she, he, she loves to hear Joe sing. But both of them are so gifted musically. They do a great job of what they do. They are gifted. And not only do they feel it, but other people can express it. Some of you guys are great at hospitality. You're a, you, you talk a mile a minute. You love shaking people's hands and talking. Some of you are a recluse. You will come in and sit in a service, and if you don't talk to anybody the whole service, you're okay with that. But you have different abilities and different giftings. I, I'll pick on these guys just for a little bit. Rodney and Amy Myers, I've known them for a long time. In fact, Amy is kin to me. We have some uh, connections with kin folks. But as they began to come to our church and they would just say, where can you use us? What do you have us doing? Well, I had greeters. I had worship people. They're very gifted musically. I had all these things and I was just saying, where in the world could I put them? I knew what their abilities and their talents were and I began to just pray about it and we said, would you guys help us with our volunteer ministries? What does that look like? I'm not sure. Let's talk about it. And the more we talked about it and Taylor made it to what their giftings and abilities were, what we found out is that they found a place in ministry that they can excel and they do a fantastic, fantastic job of taking this burden off of me and now being able to do what they're fueled and gifted and what God designed them to do, to take a ministry way beyond what this pastor could ever do. It. They've exceeded my abilities because they are so gifted at what they do. And now they're going to be gone next week. So we're recruiting 10 people to take their place because that's how many it's going to take to take their place because they're going to be gone. So, but it's the first time they've been gone since I've known them. So I'm kidding. Probably close. No, maybe not. But, but when you can find what your abilities and talents are and use them for the kingdom of God, it makes a difference in your life and it makes a difference in the people who are all the way around you. Let me ask you these questions. Let me keep going. What have you been trained to do? What certifications do you hold? What degrees do you have? Are you using those for the kingdom of God? And can we use those in the church, your expertise, to be able to take this ministry to another level and reach more people than we ever before? I'll give you another case I'll give you another example. I'm gonna pick on some people here and call their names out. I'm sure I'm gonna embarrass them, but that, that's the way that goes. Let me, let me just say a few of you guys. One of the things that I enjoy dabbling with and understand that it's a ministry that's growing is our, our video and our cameras. We, we video all the services and we put those online and sometimes it's a long process of being able to do it. And I'm the one who's heading that up because I don't have anybody else that I teach as many people as I know, but I just don't know that much about it. So as you see our videos, you'll see, well, you can tell whoever's doing that doesn't know a whole lot about it. That's me. So I just don't know that much about it. But I realize that there's, there's places and things that we can do and we can go that are far beyond what, we could, what I can accomplish myself. So as we begin to move into this new place and just pray about it, and the Lord began to put on my heart, we need to expand this ministry. One thing that we had a, a few people come in and it was just kind of neat because of their experiences. One guy came in, um, um, Armando, he, he is here, Ortega. He came in and said, the thing I really enjoyed doing is running cameras. Oh, great. In almost the same week, we had another kid come in, Mike Tart. I don't know if Mike's here this morning. Mike Tart just graduated uh, from the University of Maryland, moved here to Tulsa to take the job. He, he produces, I may not have the verbiage right on this, Mike, if you're here, forgive me. He produces the five o'clock news on channel eight. He's the producer that writes all of that and produces it. Fantastic. He can help us with this kind of stuff. 
And then we have Dr. Culp, who, Dr. Evan Culp, who has been a part of our congregation here. Almost the same week he comes, and his experience, he's a professor at ORU, and his experience is being over the multimedia department and, and the cameras and all that kind of stuff. That's what his experience is. And he's got great experience. And all these people are saying, listen, we want to come help do this. Bruce is another guy back here that's got experience with cameras. And now all of a sudden we have all these people coming in saying, listen, we have this expertise. What can we do? And then we were able to buy some, uh, some used camera equipment, a whole camera system at pennies on the dollar from a, a company that wasn't using them anymore. And in these next few weeks, we're going to be able to put that together and be able to stream live and start a cyber service online and have people from wherever that want to come in and be a part of our service. We can do that online and cut our production down and be able to have 4K cameras and put it out there the very best quality it can. But you see how God just begins to use people's talents and abilities? This is my ability. This is my talent. I want to use it for the kingdom of God. And as you come in and do that, then God uses what you've been through and what you've done and who you are for the glory of God. Isn't that exciting? I think that's exciting, and I'm excited to have that part, portion of it going. Number four, I'm gonna try to go through these really quickly because I'm running out of time here. Number four is, is personality. P is personality. S-H-A-P, personality. What's your personality type? Again, this gets into a little psychology. I didn't have a scripture so much that went with this because this is, again, an assessment that we do. Gary Smalley, years ago, wrote, wrote a book, and he came out with four personality types where he called the lion, the otter, the golden retriever, and the beaver. He says those are four types of personalities. Makes sense to me. The, the, the lion is always taking charge. He's firm. He's adventurous. He's strong. He's a born leader. It's that type that runs over everybody else. He's just that, that's the lion. The otter is enthusiastic. He loves to have fun. He's a partier. He's verbal. He loves to talk. He's the social butterfly that's always running around shaking people's hands and wanting to hug everybody. That's the otter, he or she. The golden retriever is the loyal, is the calm one, is the one that has wisdom, is the one that never gets flustered. He's always or she's always steadfast. That's what we call the golden retriever. And the beaver is the one who just wants to be given a job. He likes to work. She likes to work. They're methodical. They, they like to read all the instructions. They're, they're just, they like doing that. They like sequence. They like structure. And they're going to get the job done. Four personality types. And a lot of us fall into those. Maybe everybody falls into those personality types. Back in ancient Greco and Arabic medicine, they came up with four types that maybe some of you guys have gone, if you've gone through college or maybe in your high school times, you've, you've heard them. Choleric, sanguine, phlegmatic, and um, melancholic. Those four are basically the same kind of thing. Choleric, choleric is driven, deep thinkers, all business. Everything's black and white. They're the people that will run over you. The sanguine are carefree. They're adventurous. They're optimistic. They love life. They're that type of person. The phlegmatic are people-oriented. They love harmony. They love relationships. Uh, they're, they're that type of person, very creative. And the melancholic are the ones that don't like change. They're loyal, but they tend sometimes to be kind of uh, blah. You know, they, they tend to go through depression. So we have these types of of personalities that we see that everybody falls into. And when you find out what kind of personality you are, it helps you know what ministry that you can be best be a part of. We don't want a melancholic person back here shaking hands as people are coming in the church. Hi, how are you? Great to have you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, you can, there's, yeah, okay, see ya. We don't want that type of person. We want the otter who's like, dude, Thanks for coming, shaking hands. Here's a bulletin. Go grab a cup of coffee. Can I introduce you to our pastor? What, you know, can I help? We want that type of person doing that. We, we, we can put you in ministry and we want to find out what your giftedness is. Now, I say all of that to come to this very last one because this is the one that God has laid on my heart so specifically. And it's the last one and I'm calling it experiences. Experiences, S-H-A-P-E. Last one is experiences. What are your experiences? What have you been through in your life that God can use? Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that all things work for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. We know that all things work together for the good. There are four types of experiences that I'm just highlighting here that we can talk about. Just There's lots of experiences. God can use anything, but here's four. Number one is this. 
difficult experiences. Over these last few weeks, I have talked to several people who are going through difficult times. Single moms, people who are just without a job, going through hard times in their lives. And I don't know, it's always that encouragement thing inside of me, whatever personality type that is in me, that always wants to say, listen, God can use you. The stuff that you've been through in your life, God can use for his glory. The mistakes you've made, the problems you've gone through, the hurt you've experienced, God can use that. There's no wasted experience in the kingdom of God. God can use that kind of stuff. Illnesses that you've been through, he can use those things. Back in probably 1990, 1991, somewhere back in that time, um, we got the news that my mom had breast cancer. I was, uh, I, th- I think, we, well, we weren't married yet, were we, sweetie? We weren't married yet. Uh, mom was about my age right now. And uh, we found out that she had breast cancer. We didn't know the extent of it. We just found that out. Dad told me one day, and I was getting ready to actually leave to go uh, speak a youth retreat uh, up in Kansas, up in the, um, in the Kansas area, uh, Kansas City area. And uh, he told me just before I left, and obviously they didn't know the extent of it. They'd just gotten the word back from the doctor. And so I carried that burden with me all the way up there as I drove up to Kansas by myself. The pastor of the church I knew I was good friends with. And I went into his office and uh, I sit down and I told him what was going on. I told him what had happened and that we'd found out my mom had cancer. And um, his response to me was just basically, well, we're gonna be praying for you, you know. I pray that everything goes all right and just kind of go in that direction. And it's, I, I understand that. Sometimes it's hard to understand how to, how to deal with those kind of things. I, I needed him to... to to give me a hug. I needed someone to cry on. I, 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 I was scared and broken and didn't know what tomorrow was going to hold. And I'm not faulting him. I'm not blaming him, but he hadn't been through these kind of experiences. And I had to kind of walk through that by myself. And I'll never forget going through the anger and the, the hurt and the, you know, God, come on. I mean, of all people, you know, my parents have been in ministry all of their lives. Um, you know, we're the ones that are usually holding the Kleenex for everyone else. How, how is it that we go through this? And I'm happy to report to you that she has been over 20 years uh, completely free of cancer. Uh, cancer is completely gone. They were able to get every bit of it. But God has done a great work in her life and to the glory of God because of that. Yeah. But here's the thing. A few years later, I had a young kid in the youth group come up to me and ask me if he could talk, and I said, yeah. He came to my office, and he said, I just found out that my mom has cancer. I didn't pat him on the back and say, I'll be praying for him. I put my arm around him, and I cried with him. And I said, I know you're scared. I know exactly what you're going through because I went through the same thing myself. But let me tell you, my mom's completely healthy today. She is completely cancer-free. And all the fear that I had in my life has been completely gone. And now God is using the things that I've gone through within my family to now reach and help other people through what they've gone through because I went through that very same thing. I don't know what you've gone through in your life. You might be a single mom. You might be the, 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 the result of a divorced family. Your mom and dad may have abandoned you and left you and you've been bitter about it for years. Can I tell you that the great thing about Christianity is that we can use the stick that the enemy tried to beat us up with we can take it out of his hands and use it to beat him up with the same stick that he tried to beat us up with. What the enemy has meant to destroy your life and to kill, that's, that's, that's his only purpose. Scripture says he only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He can't love, he can't encourage, he can't help you, he can't advance you. All he does is kill, steal, and destroy. 
He comes to corrupt your life. And that same enemy that comes, we can use what he meant to try to destroy our lives with it and turn it back on him and help other people to get out of the hell that they're in in their lives. So I want you to know something. I don't know what you've been through. Some of you, I know you pretty closely and I know the things and you're going through stuff right now and you're saying, why in the world does God let me go through this stuff? How in the world can I get out of it? How can any good come out of what's going on? He will bring good out of it because he will bring you a testimony that you can reach the people of the world through what he's doing in your life. Amen? Let me go through the rest of this real quickly and then I'll end. Difficult experiences. Uh, incarcerations, addictions, illnesses. He can use those things. Relational experiences, divorce, abandonment, abuse, positive influences. He can use those. Mentoring influences where you have someone who mentored you and helped you. You can use that to help other people and reach out to those people who are around you. Achievement experiences, promotions, awards, success, those kind of things that you have in your life, you can use those for the kingdom of God. Ministry experiences, missions, outreach, deliverance, music, administration, whatever your experiences ministry-wise are, God can use those. He wants to use those. And he's got a great purpose and a great plan for your life. Now, what we do as a church is that we try to help you find those things. I want to do this this morning just to help you. When we come out with this next uh, steps program, it will have these elements in here so that you can find out exactly what God has gifted you to do so that now we can get you involved in ministry and that you can be used of God in wherever place that you go. Because I want you to know, you're not too old. You're not too far gone. You're not too young. God is not finished with you yet. He has a ministry for you. He has something he wants you to do in the world. He has something he wants you to do in the world. When I was, oh, this has been probably 10 years ago, something like that. I, I like to study in my backyard. <laughs> I just enjoy doing that. I like being outside and as the weather permits, I like to go sit out in my backyard and, and study. And I like to take a book back there, read, or I'll take my computer back there and just do my studying, and especially on Saturday nights. I don't know why, but I enjoy going out in my backyard and just being there. I'm alone. I know my neighbors think I'm weird because I walk around a lot. And uh, I just, I pray and I just like being in my backyard. One time I was in the backyard and I was trying to prepare for a message and man, it just, the stuff wasn't coming. It just seemed like a block to me. I just couldn't get what I felt God wanted for the message and for the people. And I had, a, at the time, Lisa had bought me a chimenea, you know, the, the ceramic chimeneas, and I had it, and I had built a fire in there, and the wood was a little bit wet, so it wasn't starting very well. And at one point, I had it going, and then it died out, and I put some more wood on it, and it wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't fire up. I knew there were coals in it, but I just couldn't get the fire to go. And I reached down and I blew in it. I blew in my mouth that I could see the embers light up and it would light up for a little while. Yes. And then it would go back down. And I kept doing that, kept, and I just couldn't get it going. As I continued on just thinking, I thought, you know what, God? That's my life right there. I know your power's there. I know that you're able. But it just seems like I can't get it going. It just seems like, I don't know, maybe I'm done. Maybe ministry wasn't the thing I should be going through. And I just started contemplating those kind of things. Is there anything else I could do? Could I do another bit? Could I, do, could I risk that now? I would just, I was tired. I just, I just forgot about ministry for a while, and I just wanted to sit there contemplating my life and things that I had done and where I was going. And as I sit there, it was almost, here in Oklahoma, you know what this is like, a cold front blew through. It was almost like at one minute, everything was nice, and all of a sudden, here comes a wind, and it was cold. And I had a jacket on, and I put my hood up and I pulled my jacket up and I was just cold and I just thought, I'm just going to sit here. God, this is just like my life. I mean, I just feel cold. I feel alone. I feel, I feel abandoned. I just don't, I don't know that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And as I sit there, I, 
I heard some crackling and I saw the glow of the fire and I looked down. And the wind that had blown through now had caught the edge of that chimney and had swirled inside of that chimney. And now as I looked down, those embers began to glow and that wood began to catch on fire. And as I sit there and watched it for a couple of minutes, now those embers had completely caught in that wood on fire and the wood was ablaze. There was fire coming up. It was, it was a gigantic fire. I put a lot of wood in there. I put a ton of wood in there trying to get that thing going. And now every bit of that wood was on fire and it was ablaze. And I felt the Lord say to me, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not done with you yet. Man's efforts to start all of man's abilities isn't what's going to get it going. But when the breath of heaven, when the wind of the Spirit comes and blows through the coals of my life, it begins to set on fire the wood that was wet, the wood that I thought was done, the wood that I didn't think was even going to be used anymore. Now the wind begins to blow across those coals and now there is an ablaze fire because God is saying to me and he's saying to you, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not done with you yet. Your talents and your abilities till your last dying day, I can use them to love people, to touch people, to win people to the kingdom of God. We have to make a decision. Are we going to continue to live down here with these turkeys when we could be soaring with eagles? I say let's soar with the eagles. Amen. Amen. Oh.